Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian and here at the Surface Navy Association's annual conference and trade show just outside Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Navy Surface Force leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by Huntington Ingalls Industries, General Electric Marine, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we're starting our coverage here at the Northrop Grumman stand to talk to Todd Levitt, a retired United States Navy commander, former commanding officer of uh, USS uh, Winston Churchill, one of the uh, cooler ships in the force in part because of its unique uh, um, uh, U.S.-U.K. heritage and the fact that you always have a British uh, Royal Navy navigator Absolutely. aboard uh, aboard the, the ship and some illustrious uh, former Royal Navy navigators have served on that ship, including Nigel Essenhai, whose, whose, whose dad was uh, first Sea Lord and going, going places. Uh, you're the Vice President for uh, uh, Maritime uh, Systems and the Mission Systems uh, Unit. Um, you guys are, uh, in, in the business you run is uh, the Elmer Sperry uh, founded the great navigational uh, unit in the company. It's a hundred year partnership you have with, with the U.S. Navy. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a time of intense discussion about uh, the accidents, what have been learned, the challenges and problems with electronic navigation, uh, which have been discussed a lot in, uh, in surface warfare circles. Talk to us a little bit about some of the technological innovation you guys are bringing to the fore to give greater surety, greater confidence, greater usability, and at the end of the day, everybody is looking for greater precision in navigation, uh, whether for war fighting or just from, for transiting uh, on a daily basis. Talk to us a little bit about some of the new things you guys are introducing uh, to build a better navigational system for the future. Sure, Vogue. Well, first of all, uh, been, been a big fan. First time on with you, been a big fan of yours for a while, so appreciate everything you do uh, for national security for our nation as well. Uh, first off. Thanks very much, that's a real honor, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first off, you know, as you mentioned, we do have a hundred year legacy working navigation in the United States Navy. You mentioned Elmer Sperry in 1910, he invented the gyroscope. Uh, that evolved in World War I, where the first fire control system was supported on World War I battleships. It evolved through the 30s and the 40s to where uh, the legacy Sperry Marine had tens of thousands of employees creating navigation uh, instruments to support our you know, thousand ship Navy in World War II. Um, through the 60s and 70s and 80s, we continued to evolve navigation products and navigation aids to help the United States Navy as we evolve through the Cold War to where we are right now. Three big things we're working on right now that we think are very important uh, are uh, ECTIS, the Electronic Charting Display Information System. Um, we invented um, the uh, electronic navigation portion, which really brings electronic charts and the ability to use navigation sensors to show where you are as opposed to where you were on uh, um, and former visual aids and the way they've been used in the past. Uh, we've been working on ECTIS for a number of years and continue to do so with the Navy. We're also the producer of the WISN-7 and, and also working on the WISN-12, which are inertial navigation systems that both provide navigational capability for surface ships and submarines, but also links to weapon systems and combat systems to provide that navigation assurity. Uh, and then the third thing we've been doing that really helped the Navy is on an integrated bridge system. We've worked throughout the years to bring together the various systems on a ship in an integrated manner to help sailors control and navigate the ship. And we've been doing that for a number of years and continue to do so on integrated bridges right now with the U.S. Navy. Um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, a little bit of a subtlety. You were on a ship where you saw uh, both sides of how to navigate. Uh, the Royal Navy is always looking ahead and where you're going to be, whereas we do our navigation based pretty much on where you've been as, as building forward on, on that track. I mean, it's a combination of stuff, a, a combination of those factors. Um, but talk to us about the integration of both of these plots and the intellectual process for a surface warfare officer that when you go through all of your navigation training, whether you were at a, as a midshipman and all, all the way on up has been based on where you've been as opposed to sort of more about than where you're going. Well, navigation has evolved from a point where uh, visual aids were very important and, and taking a bearing or a bearing in a range off a position to fix a position to ship lets you know where you were when you took that bearing in that range and then you had to basically evaluate event, environmental factors to determine where you're going. Now with electronic navigation integrated with the use of visual navigation you can use that certain system that's worked for, for hundreds of years of visual navigation, integrate it with inertial navigation, global positioning system, and elect charting, uh, electronic charting system to allow you to both assess where you are visually, where you are electronically, and where you're headed in a much more efficient manner. So it's really the evolution of using the, the tried and true visual aids with the electronic aids to help sailors understand where they're headed. Um, talk to us a little bit uh, about denied environment operation, right? I mean, once you align the platform, 
uh, the platform operates, but you always have to tweak it. And now there's greater uh, concern about what happens in a GPS denied environment, right. especially if it's in a protracted uh, basis. Um, now midshipmen are learning and, and junior officers are more using celestial right. navigation. Go celestial. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always a lot of fun, actually. Uh, but anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about um, some of the systems you guys are developing to ensure that that aligned platform stays aligned for prolonged periods of time potentially until you can get star updates and a whole bunch of other things to keep it current given that in the kind of contested battle space environments we're going to go into, knowing exactly where everybody is, is is of paramount importance. So, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Vago. Assured position, navigation, and timing is a key effort that we've been working on here at Northrop Grumman. It's a key effort for the Department of Defense. Because as you highly, you pointed out, the global positioning system, is a lot of reliance on it. We rely it for our iPhones. You probably relied on it to drive here today uh, to a certain extent, right? Well, that is used at sea, and there is some concern around uh, the, the assured navigation environment, how you can can you do that? We are spending a lot of efforts, a lot of research and development to determine how we can continue to use the systems of today, bringing in other senses. You mentioned celestial. Uh, there's visual, there's optical. There are other sensors, inertial, better inertial navigation sensors, that when you bring the suite of sensors together, gives you that assured positioning, navigation, and timing to help in that uh, denied environment. So it's something in North Grumman we're working on very, very robustly, very, very actively, and I think you're going to see that evolve over the next few years. Um, let me uh, ask you, you guys uh, also do integrated power uh, right. on, on ships. Uh, you know, increasingly the U.S. Navy wants to go to all electric drive on, on its ships. We've certainly seen that uh, on the Zumwalt and on the Ford uh, as well. Um, talk to us a little bit about integrated power and what sort of, what's, what's the north of vision about where the integrated power future of the Navy resides? So I think our vision aligns with where the Navy's headed, which is a recognition that, you know, as technology evolves, a power and cooling become very important. Um, and the ability to generate power is one thing, but it's the ability to, to condition and distribute power on ships, it becomes very important. And one of the visions that the Navy has right now, and Northrop Grumman has worked on very actively, is the idea around integrated power in an energy magazine, in a way that you can take the power generation, store it, condition it, and distribute it, so you can use it for a radar, you can use it for directed energy, for various systems. It's a, 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 a system that, the, and a vision the Navy has, and is working very actively, and we're spending a lot of time and energy to determine how we bring integrated power and an energy magazine concept into the surface fleet. Um, are you satisfied. Um, that's certainly key, especially if you're looking at ray gun, rail guns and directed energy to take massive amounts of power that you're going to need and then have enough in that magazine to do multiple shots before you have to regenerate. Are you getting to the power density requirements uh, that the Navy would need in order to be able to operate some of these heavy, heavy duty weapons, especially over a prolonged period of time. You don't have to think all that much about firing your right. gun, for example, right. or, or, or firing your missile, but it becomes a much, much more it just becomes a much, much bigger challenge when you're when you're uh, collecting that kind of energy right. and discharging it, especially at a, at a at a high fire rate. So, technology is there today, right? How that works into you know. Uh, when we work with shipbuilders, we talk a lot about swap, right? Size, weight, power, and cooling, uh, and how that fits onto a ship. How you take that technology and how that fits into an FFGX or how that fits into a large surface combat. Navy's worked in very actively on. We're working to see how those requirements flow out. Technology's there, those requirements are going to evolve over these number of years to get to that type of capability you alluded to, where whether it's a rail gun, gun a direct energy weapon, uh, whether it's electronic warfare, you have that ability to apply those uh, weapons and sensors simultaneously. Simultaneously. And uh, let me ask you uh, about your very, very unique ship, uh, the Winston Churchill uh, uh, Arleigh Burke uh, class uh, destroyer, the last inclined launch, if I remember, from Bath Iron Works, uh, which was uh, another uh, historic element before the land level facility uh, was uh, completed. What, what's so special about the ship, and, and why is that interplay between uh, very, very highly qualified Royal Navy folks and U.S. Navy folks so important? You know, what, what, what's special about the ship, and what did you learn from your British counterparts? Even even when you were uh, the commanding officer, for example, even though you may have had a, a young lieutenant in that job. So this goes back a few years, right? it's uh, a number of years when I was in command. Uh, it was a very special ship because of the linkage to the Royal Navy, um, obviously. Um, uh, I was also very fortunate to take the ship on deployment twice in the United Kingdom and got to get to Portsmouth and up into uh, um, uh, Fas Lane and visit. And uh, the, the, the affinity that the, the 
United Kingdom citizens had for those sailors coming off the Winston S. Churchill was something I'd never seen before, and it was fabulous. I was also very, very fortunate at the time that Mary Soames, Churchill's, Winston S. Churchill's youngest daughter, was still alive and visited the ship and spent a day in the ship. And just a fabulous, fabulous experience, realizing that I'm sitting across the table having tea with the daughter of Winston S. Churchill was just unbelievable, Vago. Uh, likewise, I was able to, uh, his, uh, one of his grandsons, Winston S. Churchill III, his son Randolph's son, uh, hosted us uh, up in London and uh, had us for lunch. And an experience of, of just seeing, bringing us to his house and showing us his father's paintings, right? And the watercolors of Chartwell and just the, the fabulous, the, the fabric of just the, the Britishness was just fabulous. But getting back to your, your question, it's really that unique relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States that was embodied in that ship. As you well know, we had a Royal Navy navigator. It was a special experience, a special ship, and a special relationship I think the two navies have. And uh, we should give a shout out that uh, Winston uh, S. Churchill was not just uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom illustriously twice, uh, but also was a First Lord of the Admiralty, which is another great title which has gone uh, the way of the dodo. Todd, thanks uh, so very much. Really you, appreciate Mark. it. Todd Levitt, Vice President for Maritime Systems at Northrop Grumman Mission Systems, uh, Maritime Systems. Sir, thanks uh, very Thank much. You. Really appreciate it. Best of luck at the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vago.